So you will have to excuse me because it's harder for me to speak clearly with only one arm. <laughs> Our book of the month for the, the month of June is the book of Galatians. And Galatians is, Galatia, just for, to orient you, is modern day Turkey. And Galatians is really only a few pages in length. And so you actually could read Galatians every single day this month if you wanted to, and it wouldn't take you more than about 15 minutes a day. And if you did that, you'd virtually have the book memorized by the end of the month. Just saying. So Paul likely wrote Galatians in the very late 40s or the early 50s, and very close to the time that he wrote the book or the letter to Romans. And like Romans, Galatians is largely about justification by faith. The belief that salvation is a free gift of God that is accepted, not earned. Okay, that's important to understand. Justification by faith is the belief that salvation is the free gift of God that is accepted, not earned. But unlike Romans, which is very carefully developed, calmly logical, and the longest of all of Paul's letters, Galatians is passionate, emotional, and brief. It doesn't take long when you start reading Galatians to detect that Paul had received news that he found quite upsetting. And what made Paul angry and what motivated him to write his letter to the churches in Galatia was a hugely important issue for the future of the way of Christ. And that issue was, did Gentile Christians, did non-Jewish Christians need to convert to Judaism in the process of becoming a disciple of Christ. Okay? Did they need to follow all of the law of Moses and other Jewish customs and traditions? Paul said, no, that's not necessary. But after Paul had left Galatia, some other Jewish Christian teachers apparently came to the Galatians and told them the answer was, in fact, yes, that they needed to do all of these things. Well, Paul was really, really ticked. And so Galatians is Paul's defense of his mission to the Gentiles. And Galatians ends up providing the basis for the growth of the Christian movement independent of its original Jewish roots. I understand today it's going to feel a little bit more like a Bible study, but you really need to understand this because it's really important. So Paul's main point in Galatians is that trusting in Christ and his love for us and the sacrifice of his death is what makes one righteous and acceptable to God. And so today I want to share with you just one verse, Galatians 2.20. Here it is. Say it with me. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That one verse is an excellent summary of what happens when one becomes a Christian. It's a good life verse to memorize and to think of often. It's actually one of the first Bible verses I memorized way back in my early 20s when I really started getting serious about memorizing Scripture, which is a really good thing to do, by the way. Now, one thing to notice about that verse immediately, and you may have picked up on it, is how many personal pronouns there are in just one verse. How many times Paul says, I and me, right? I've been crucified. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live. I live by faith who loved me and gave himself for me. The irony is all of that stuff needs to go. I, me, and my need to die so Christ can live in us. I'll say that again. I and me and my need to die so Christ can live in us. 
Today, as we've said, is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day when the church remembers and celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the first disciples of Christ. That Holy Spirit comes upon them and empowers them, gives them the ability to live fully as followers of Jesus. In a sense, today is the birthday of the church. We're also welcoming new members today, as the early church did on Pentecost. So I thought it would be good to share in a very basic way, what does it mean when a person repents, believes the good news, is baptized, and welcomed into the body of Christ? So that's why I picked Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, if you're looking in your Bible, you see it's found in the midst of a statement that Paul is making about the law. When I say the law, that's the law of Moses. That's what we call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, especially the first five books. Paul's making a statement about the law compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ and life in the Spirit. And his point is that nobody is justified or made right with God by obeying God's law because none of us fulfills God's law completely or perfectly. We can't do it. And the law, while mostly good in what it advocates, think of the Ten Commandments, for example, primarily ends up serving to show us how far we fall short of the holiness that God desires, right? So you can look even just at the Ten Commandments and then look at your own life and say, well, how well am I doing with the, oh, gee, I didn't do so well with this one or that one. That's what the law ends up doing. Paul says the good news of the gospel, on the other hand, is that through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven by God's grace, and from then on we seek to live the faith of Jesus Christ in a way that gives glory and honor to God. So I just want to walk you really briefly through these different parts of Galatians 2.20. It starts with Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. The first and perhaps the most difficult part of being a Christian is dying to self. Dying to self. Being crucified with Christ. And Paul uses the present tense, so it truly reads... I have been and continue to be crucified with Christ. Indicating an action that was done in the past which continues to shape the present. If you're looking for pain-free spirituality, Christianity isn't it. It hurts crucifying yourself. Right? To be crucified with Christ hurts. Think about the two men on either side of Jesus when he was crucified. Imagine being in that position yourself. How awful that must have been. That's the image Paul is using of what we have to do voluntarily to follow Christ. Later on in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, Paul writes, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now throughout Galatians, if you read it, you're going to find that Paul contrasts what he calls life in the flesh or life according to the flesh with life in the spirit. And I'm going to talk about that in depth two weeks from today. But I have to tell you, so you understand this morning, That whenever Paul writes of the flesh, when he writes of the body, when he writes of the world, he is not saying that our physical body is bad, although sometimes it betrays us. He's not saying our physical body is bad. He's not saying the world is bad and of no consequence. When he writes about the flesh and the world, he's writing about a way of living. He's writing about a way of being. And it's a way of living that is self-focused dominated by selfish passions, anger, a lack of self-control, greed, given to ungodly ways of thinking and living and speaking, that's living according to the flesh. And Paul would say that someone whose life manifests those kinds of behaviors is clearly not living according to the Spirit. In Galatians 6, Verse 14, Paul states, May I never boast of anything except the cross 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So Paul writes repeatedly about this theme of dying with Christ, being crucified with Christ. It also appears a couple times in Romans chapter 6 and verses 6 and 11 where Paul says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The hard truth is we are not ready to embark on a life of discipleship until we're willing to be crucified with Christ and to die to our former way of life. And this isn't easy. And sometimes I think we can approach God thinking that we just need the Lord's help with our very obvious areas of sin or need or brokenness. God, most of my life is fine. I just need your help in these couple areas. You know, we look at our life like a banana with a couple of brown spots. And we just want God to cut out a couple of the brown spots and we think we're fine. And meanwhile, God is standing there looking at us saying, I want the whole banana. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Being willing to die is difficult. But the blessing of doing so is that that's what has to happen so that Christ may live in us. I suspect there are many people who, if you ask them, would say, are, am I a Christian? Sure, I'm a Christian. But their lives clearly reveal they haven't died to self. Their lives are still dominated by what Paul call, would call selfish passions. Other people may be frustrated because they don't sense, they don't feel, they don't experience the power of Christ in their life. And they wonder why. Often it's because we haven't been willing to take this step to die to self. We just want God to bless us as we are with no intention to change or to grow in Christ. We have to die to self for Christ to live in us. It's as simple as that. And Paul is saying the way we become fully united with Christ in his death and his resurrection is by taking that step. Romans 8, verse 11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. It's amazing to think, if you really sit with it, to think that the Spirit of God is living in you as you follow Christ. God has brought us from death to life, and then our part becomes to continually change and shape our habits so that Christ can live in us ever more fully. And this is something that Paul writes about in his letters numerous times. He says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, for example, examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? you. He writes about it in Colossians 1.27 where he refers to Christ in you, the hope of glory. Galatians 2.20 concludes, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God or by the faith of the Son of God. It can be translated either way. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Having faith in someone means we trust them. It's easier to have faith in someone and to trust them if we know they love us, especially someone who loves us to the extent of being willing to give their very life for us. In the introduction of Galatians, Paul writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. And Paul repeats this early central Christian tradition here in chapter 2 and verse 20. He states it again in 1 Timothy in chapter 2 and verse 5. 
For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. If the Bible is about anything, it's about the self-giving love and forgiveness of God. It's about the self-giving love and forgiveness of God, which is seen in its highest form, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you truly understand how much God loves you, you, it truly changes your life. Nothing is so fundamental to the Christian journey as knowing and feeling that we are loved. And this is the basis of the whole of what it means to be a Christian. It's from the experience of God's love that we know the grace of God and we then live out every other dimension of our Christian faith. We're able to grow in faith because we can be so sure and certain of God's love for us, which can't be earned. It's just accepted as a free gift. Many years ago, a young man approached a pastor with a question that came out of this verse. He asked the pastor, what does it mean as far as this life to be crucified with Christ? And the pastor told him it means three things. First, someone on a cross is facing only one direction. Secondly, that person is never going back. And third, they have no further plans of their own. Think about that. Some people are trying to face in two directions at once because their heart is still divided. Am I living for myself? Am I living for God? What am I doing? I kind of like to have a little bit of both. You know, a lot of people want Christ in their life enough to go to heaven, but they also love being in control of their life and doing whatever they want when they want it. Just saying. Secondly, a crucified person is not returning to their former life. Their former life is over. Death separates them completely from the life they once knew. And one who has been crucified with Christ has settled the matter in their heart and never wants to go back to their old I, me, my life. One who has been crucified, we don't have any further plans of our own. As we sing often in a song in this service, we yield all those plans, right? We yield them because we want to pursue and fulfill God's plans. Galatians 2.20 asks us to reflect just on a few simple questions. Have I been crucified with Christ? Is my old self dead, or if at least not dead, is it dying? Is Christ living in me in such a way that Christ is visible in and through me? Is Christ influencing your life for God and not just for yourself? Are you living in the Spirit and by God's Word? If not, Paul would say, then be crucified today. That was the life Paul lived, a life crucified with Christ, a life in which Christ lived in him in a way that was obvious to everybody around him. And because he was able to be crucified with Christ, Christ lived in Paul incredibly fully. It's living out this verse that we come to fully appreciate and understand its truth. A man walked into a restaurant and he ordered a bowl of clam chowder. And when the server brought it to the table, the man looked at the server and said, taste the chowder. And the server said, is, uh, sir, is something wrong? I can get you another bowl right away. And the man said, taste the chowder. Sir, if there's something you want me to tell the chef, just tell me. Taste the chowder. Fine, fine, the service says, exasperated. I'll taste it. Where's the spoon? Exactly. (laughs) Sometimes you have to do what's being asked of you before you understand why it's required. Sometimes you have to do what's being asked of you 
before you understand why it's required. You have to be willing to taste the chowder to discover that the spoon is missing. In Christian spirituality, understanding follows obedience. It's as we obey what God tells us to do that we come to understand more fully why God is asking us to do it. There's a great old jazz standard written by Gerald Marks and Seymour Simmons back in 1931, All of Me. Some of you, people old like me, remember versions by Billie Holiday or Ella Fitzgerald or Frank Sinatra. Younger people know a totally different song by John Legend and some other people. But in the old song, it starts by simply saying, All of me. Why not take all of me? Can't you see? I'm no good without you. Paul is hoping that is what you will sing to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. And I'm going to pray this prayer in an I form like I'm praying it for all of us. Merciful God, I thank you for your work in my life through Christ. As you remake me to be more like your Son and my Savior, I trust that you will use me in ways beyond what I can imagine. Please take my heart and cleanse it thoroughly. Please take my life and use it mightily. Please expand my thoughts and help me dream more majestically. May all of this be empowered by the Spirit of your Son's life in me. And may all I do, dream, and desire be for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.